Thank you very much, Anna, and hello, everybody. Thank you for coming here. Uh, if somebody, Anna, can you unmute uh, your mic to say that you can see my slides, please? I can see your slides. Great. So you're absolutely fine. So, as Anna said, this is um, my name is Piridul Anthanasiadou, and I'm a research scientist at SRUC, uh, based in uh, just outside Edinburgh at the Roslyn Institute building. Uh, and I'm going to be presenting the the the, the concept and the some of the results of the Relax project. Uh, the Relax project is a collaboration of uh, almost uh, uh, 40 different uh, participants, uh, but the uh, uh, obviously, the focus is going to be on the work we have been doing, and this is a, a collaboration between. Uh, uh, this is a collaboration on the alternatives to anthelmintics, uh, and uh, with Anna from the Soil Association has been instrumental in that, but also other people from uh, from different countries. So uh, it's um, uh, Catherine and Olivia and Alex and Philippe from France, uh, Werner and Suzanne from uh, uh, Germany, uh, and Stefan and Veronica from Switzerland. These are the uh, the different partners for the particular work package, which is looking at the replacement of anthelmintics in European organic uh, livestock. So just uh, the layout of the presentation today, a little bit of an introduction on the RELAX project, just a bit more on what I've already said. Uh, I have a little bit on the impact of worms. I always like to start my presentations like that because it's just put everything into context and it shows what a big issue it is. Uh, I'll be introducing the two alternatives that we have been looking throughout RELAX, and, and this is uh, Heather and uh, Nematophagus fungi. And then I'm going to be presenting the results of the unfarmed trials we did uh, through the Basket of Options trial, uh, and some points on the economic and environmental assessment of alternatives that we did uh, through RELAX. So the RELAX project is a European Union project. Uh, and it's looking not just at anthelmintics, but also replacement of other contentious inputs in organic farming. So in plant production, that includes copper, mineral oil and fertilizers, and in livestock production, anthelmintics, antibiotics and synthetic vitamins. So these are the contentious inputs for organic farming. Uh, and the European collaborators include uh, organic certification bodies and farmers organizations, uh, universities, research institutions, of course, the industry. Uh, and as I mentioned before, SRUC and the Soil Association is focusing on anthelmintics uh, and antibiotics. But today is all about anthelmintics. So just starting uh, to, to show you some um, pictures which demonstrate the impact of uh, the worms on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the animal. Uh, so worm infections reduce the performance. And everybody who's, uh, who's working with livestock would know that. And why is that the case? Uh, because animals reduce their food intake. Uh, uh, they also have uh, impaired food digestion, so they don't make a good use of the nutrients they, they ingest. Uh, there is um, damage, uh, which is resulting in protein leakage. Uh, and as a co consequence, the, uh, the nutrients are not being used as they should have been used, and also the, the gut damage needs repair. And I've got these two images because I really think they demonstrate what I just said. So the top image, uh, it shows a worm coming out of an abomasal gland, uh, gland rather, uh, in uh, the abomasum of uh, one of the infected animals. And you see how the gland has been destroyed. Uh, and that's why in animals that have inf uh, infestations of with worms, this worm in particular is a Teladorsagia circumcincta, uh, the pH in the abomasum changes and that results uh, easily increases and there is a um, problem with, uh, uh, you know, um, breaking down of the, uh, of the food as a consequence of the glands, the abomasal glands not working properly. And then at the bottom image, you can see the villi in the, in the small intestine, how on the right hand side of the image, you see how the villi should be nice and long and uh, have a lot of surface for the um, absorption of nutrients and then on the left hand side you see the damage caused by the intestinal nematode in this case. Um, so you can imagine that in both cases whether you've got an abomasal or intestinal worm the damage is a big issue and because of this damage there is less nutrients available for growth. 
Um, and as a consequence, the warm challenge is expensive. And this image, which is now a, a, an old image from the 1982 uh, by Bob Coop and his team from the Morden. Uh, but I still think it demonstrates very clearly what the actual uh, uh, cost of the challenge is. So if you look at this image a bit more carefully, on the y-axis we have the, the weight gain of an animal, and on the x-axis is the weeks of infection. And you see in the blue line at the top, uh, this is how an animal would grow if it had no challenge at all, an animal that is uh, parasite-free. Uh, then in the red dot, you see uh, a, an animal that is taking parasites, uh, almost 5,000 parasites a day, uh, which is kind of standard for animals who graze uh, to receive. It's not uncommon at all. Uh, and, and these animals are being treated uh, regularly, like every three weeks with an anthelmintic. So, uh, and if you compare that to the very bottom line, which is animals that take the same amount of larvae, so 5,000 larvae a day, but are not being drenched with an anthelmintic. So yes, drenching regularly with an anthelmintic will improve the performance of the animal. You see there is a bit of a better performance in the red animals compared to the very bottom animals. However, there is still a loss, right, compared to the no challenge animals. Uh, so despite the fact that these animals are being drenched, they're still losing out. Now, if you have a look at the second from the top line, this is the an these are the animals that are taking about a thousand larvae a day. So they're still taking parasites. They're still outside grazing, ingesting and developing their immune system because that's also important for the animal. However, they're taking less. And because they're taking less, the penalty on their growth is also smaller. So the take away message from this graph is that drenching may not always provide the answer you want, but reducing challenge can actually improve productivity and, and still ensure that the animals are taking some larvae so they're developing their immune system. So for the long term, it's more sustainable. Then for those who are not familiar with the gastrointestinal nematode life cycle, we have an adult sheep here uh, which has worms in their gastrointestinal tract. And they're excreting the eggs uh, with the feces. And then on pasture, the eggs will develop to uh, L1, L2, and L3 stages. Um, the L3s are um, the infective stages, so the animals eat them, and then these develop into adults in their gastrointestinal tract. Uh, so we have parasitic stages, which are the stages that are inside the animal from L3 onwards to the adult. And we also have free living stages, uh, which is those stages that are developing in the environment. Um, and when we're looking at parasite control, we're having two different aims. First, to reduce the gastrointestinal nematodes in sheep, but also to reduce the level of infection on pasture. And RELAX is targeting uh, both of these phases, both of what happens in the animal and both what happens in the environment uh, with the two alternatives we have been looking. So the two alternatives uh, are the heather, which everybody, I think, I'm pretty sure you know, it's uh, the plant that you see in the Scottish hills in, in spring and they look uh, gorgeous. And if you look closely, in many cases, you will actually see sheep grazing there. Uh, and the hypothesis was that, tar that heather, uh, um, heather consumption will target the parasitic stages and will reduce parasites in the animal. And the second one is the biocontrol agent called nematophagus fungi. And the killer fungi will target the free living stages of parasites and will reduce parasite contamination on pasture. So these are the two alternatives that RELAX have been looking at, one uh, for an impact inside the animal and one for the impact outside. So starting with the uh, bioactive forages. So Heather is a bioactive forage, but before I go to Heather, I thought I will share only a couple of slides to describe what these forages are. So when we're talking about bioactive forage, we mean we're referring to plants um, which uh, uh, whose intake results in antiparasitic activity. Uh, and there are a lot of 
uh, studies that have been done around the world on the potential of such bioactive forages. And you may have heard of chicory, for example, that we have at SRVC and others have tried um, and tested and shown that it has automatic properties when ingested. Same foin is mostly used in uh, other European countries, like in France. Uh, they are researching same foin a lot and they have shown antiparasitic activity. Lotus, on the other hand, has been mostly investigated in uh, Australia and New Zealand, and again showing to um, have a lot of potential uh, to be used as an alternative to anthelmintics. And this is some of the work we did on chicory, and we saw multiple benefits uh, in animals that were grazed in chicory. So here in the middle is an image of a ewe with, it, with uh, her lamb in uh, our uh, farm. That well, we don't have that farm anymore, but at uh, SRGC Aberdeen, the Talak farm, uh, they, that experiment took place there. Uh, and uh, uh, grazing on chicory reduced uh, worms, improved growth, so animals were growing better. Uh, and if you see at the bottom right um, image there, uh, it shows that actually animals on chicory had lower inputs uh, for of anthelmintic uh, drenches as well. So in blue, the animals that were on chicory were receiving less um, anthelmintics compared to the control. Uh, and as a consequence, because uh, fecal accounts is reduced, as it's shown in the top right corner, uh, uh, is uh, there is a reduced challenge on pasture, so less worms on pasture, less in intake of worms for the next season. So a benefit, we have shown quite <coughs> the, a, a, a few studies where we've seen the benefit of chicory uh, as a bioactive forage. And in this project now we're looking at heather. And uh, why heather? Um, heather is, uh, uh, is, a, is, a, is a plant uh, that is um, uh, abundant in uh, many places in, in Europe. It, it contains certain plant secondary metabolites which are called condensed tannins. Uh, and there is uh, a lot of research that has been done, including of our own, but also others, showing that plants that are rich in these uh, condensed tannins uh, have anthelmintic properties. And in addition, there are some studies from Spain that have shown that uh, goats that were grazing have reduced their parasite burden. Uh, and here in Scotland, um, we have seen, uh, and probably you have seen as well, hill sheep grazing on heather leaves. So uh, it's not impossible that um, they have an impact on the improved resistance of hill sheep in, uh, towards worms. So in RELAX, uh, we started looking at Heather with some in vitro testing. So what we did, we collected um, uh, Heather samples from various countries, Scotland, Switzerland, Norway, Germany, and Spain. Uh, we collected it over two season, uh, seasons, spring and winter, and we tested it against two different parasite species, Thaladorsetia circumcincta and the abomasal nematode, and Trichostrongyus colbiformis the intestinal one. And we also tested different species of heather and different doses of heather. And we tested that in different ways, but I have some results here from the egg hatching assay. So we're incubating the heather extracts with eggs, and we wanted to see if there was a, um, an inhibition in the uh, hatching of the eggs, which would, me which would mean that there is a, an effect of heather on, um, uh, on parasite worms. And what we showed was that there was uh, variation across different countries, which is not uh, really surprising because uh, the different headers from the different countries will, will have a variable uh, um, profile in the compounds. But we did see a, an important efficacy. So uh, the majority of the extract were having a significant effect on inhibiting the egg hatching of, uh, of the worms. Uh, and we also saw that some species, parasite species, are more susceptible than others. So, for example, the T. circumcincta one, the abomasal one, uh, showed uh, more, higher susceptibility to um, uh, incubation with heather extra compared to the intestinal. So, we had a first idea that heather can work uh, against worms, and we, we showed that uh, in RELAX. And then we had another look at what happens to the fungi. So the fungi, this nematophagus fungi is uh, Darintonia, it's called, and it can kill free-living stages of parasites. So 
previous work has shown that it can reduce pasture contamination by about 70%. Uh, it is a commercially available uh, product in some countries, for example, in Australia, uh, not yet in Europe. But and what we wanted to test here to, to test here is whether there were interactions with heather uh, in order to optimize efficacy or not. And we also use the fungi on on farm validation. So what we show in our sheep studies uh, was that uh, the use of that Antonia resulted in a in, indeed uh, a reduced recovery of of larvae. So if you see this image um, on the y-axis is the recovery of larvae, the percentage of the recovery of larvae, whereas on the x-axis are the different treatments. So you see the control treatment where about uh, an average of 50% of larvae were recovered. And when we used two different doses of that Antonia, that was dramatically reduced in terms of uh, larval recovery. So uh, indeed, it looks like the fungi are, we showed also that it was um, uh, destroying the larvae uh, in the feces and there was no larval recovery as it has been previously uh, shown. So then I will go and report on the, the farm uh, the farm trials. Um, so what we asked our farmers to do uh, is uh, to split animals into groups. So we showed in the next area that there's, that was a, a bit abrupt, but basically we showed uh, the anthelmintic properties on uh, in vitro. We also showed it, so Heather and the fungi on control experiments, and we wanted to see what happens on farm. Uh, so we've asked farmers, actually maybe the, the next, yeah, the, sorry, I'll forget that slide. I'll go to the next one because I think it's uh, it gives more information. So uh, these are two of our lovely farmers that took place in uh, uh, on farm trials in the UK. And uh, we had we had more farmers, and we had uh, a couple of farmers that participated in um, uh, other countries. So what we asked our farmers to do was um, uh, those that were associated with uh, IFOM EU, uh, which is the umbrella organization of our organic farming uh, associations in Europe. They were first invited to participate to focus groups in four countries, in France, Germany, the UK and Switzerland. And then some of these farmers uh, were asked to participate on the on-farm uh, trials. So <clears throat> in the UK, we had 11 farmers in focus groups and we had uh, five on trials. In Switzerland, we had 10 farmers in focus groups and one on trial. Uh, in Germany, four farmers on focus groups, and uh, at the mo at the moment still nobody is on trial, but there is one that is uh, likely to be trying uh, it this summer. And in France, we had seven farmers on focus groups, and we didn't have anybody on trial. It, it was more difficult to uh, to get people because of of the timing. Uh, we were told. So I'm going to do, be talking a little bit about the the, the, um, uh, the on-farm trials we did in the UK. Uh, we, as I mentioned, we had five uh, farmers that participated, and uh, on each farm, the animals were divided into two groups. Uh, we had a treatment group that they were receiving either the fungi or the heather, and we had three farmers that uh, tried the uh, fungi, and we had two farmers that tried the heather. And then there was another number, another group, which was the control group, um, and they would manage their uh, animals according to standard practices. Uh, the trial duration lasted approximately uh, six to eight weeks, and that was over spring and summer 2021. And I believe this is one of uh, uh, Gwen's animals, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe maybe I'm confusing things now. Uh, yeah. It is, yes. <laughs> So in the treatments, uh, we had, uh, as I mentioned, the treatments with either heather or uh, uh, the fungi, and the heather animals uh, were uh, grazing heather daily. They had access to heather daily. We couldn't tell how much they were eating of heather, but heather was incorporated in the daily uh, grazing, whereas the control animal did not have access to heather. And with, in relation to the Dadingtonia, the, the fungi, uh, the animals in the treatment group received one gram of, smor of spores per 100 uh, kilograms body weight in their feed intake uh, daily, whereas the control animals received no spores. 
And samples were taken at two time points. That was immediately before the trial started and then at the end of the trial. And as I said, that was between six to eight weeks. And these animal, these samples included fecal samples, uh, and these were sent to SRUC to do fecal account with one exception, where one of the farmers um, had theirs done with their local vet. Uh, we had the body weight or body composition, body condition score uh, data. And also we got uh, information from the farmers on, on, their, on the general health of the animals, including anthelmintic treatment if that was required. And then we also asked the farmers about their experience of the alternatives. So the, far, the two farmers, were well, two farmers on Heather, and the two farmers on Heather, their data showed there was not really any impact of a Heather observed, neither negative or positive. Uh, so the control animals had similar fecal accounts compared to the, those on Heather. Uh, in terms of the body condition score, uh, the results from the two farmers were um, uh, conflicting. In, uh, so in, in one of the farmers, uh, the body condition score was better in the heather animals and in the other it was in the control animals, so no clear cut there. And in terms of the health information, there was um, one of the farmers uh, mentioned that there was a tick inf infestation in the sheep in um, that were grazing heather, so more ticks in heather, which is uh, uh, something that was observed. So overall, the experience of the farmers using the um, uh, heather was, was mixed in, in the, the two farms. In relation to the fungi, and this, this is uh, the sheep from one of the farmers that used the, uh, the fungi treatment. Uh, again, the fecal accounts were not really uh, consistent. One of the, in one of the farmers, uh, there was a positive effect on the fecal accounts, in the other farmers, there was negative. Uh, and the, the body condition score and the way again uh, was uh, um, uh, in, in one farm that uh, uh, it went one direction and in the other from the other direction. There were no particular health issues uh, reported. Uh, and the farmer experience was that there was uh, effort, extra effort required to administer the fungi uh, because it was obviously daily uh, intake. Um, and uh, people said, uh, the farmers that use the fungi said that uh, if, if the control of, uh, if the reduction in the fecal accounts or if the overall level of parasitism was almost uh, around 70%, then they would, be, uh, they would be willing to spend a little bit more time on these untraditional control. Um, so um, a mixed bag as well in terms of there's more effort required, but then again, if it's working and if it's reducing the anthelmintics, then it's okay. So the conclusion from this uh, was that the experience was variable. Uh, almost all the farmers recognized that was uh, an increase in management time that may be required. Uh, they all recognized that there wasn't really any additional cost, but of course, in this case, the fungi were given for free and the and fecal account service also, with the exception of the one farmer, as I said. They're still interested to try and reduce their anthelmintic input. However, what I should say that in, in all these farmers uh, that we had on trial, the anthelmintic input was uh, relatively low anyway, uh, so there wasn't really a lot of requirement to treat the animals. They were in, uh, in good shape. Um, uh, overall, uh, so maybe this also didn't uh, didn't help towards showing uh, a bigger impact of the alternatives. Uh, in addition to this general um, uh, this general th th what I said so far, we also did some uh, um, we asked some uh, questions in relation to economics, uh, and we realized that there were some. Uh, um, there may be impact in relation to animal management costs because feeding costs, for example, may be lower for animals that are on heather, uh, whereas labor costs may be higher for the fungi application. You need more time to do that. Uh, vet, vet and medical bills may be higher in heather managed animals, and that's uh, because of the tick uh, problem. Uh, there also is a possibility that there is a, a loss of revenue evident in the heather fed animal in the short term because this is something uh, we noticed in our control study, a short term reduction in feed intake, uh, although that was not evident on farm, uh, we did see that uh, in our control study. Uh, there will be a reduction in heather managing costs, for example, if 
if uh, farmers have heather on their on their farm, uh, they would need uh, time and money to crop or burn. Uh, but if they graze it, then that's not going to be an issue. But in general, the overall uh, the overall feeling from the implementation of farm was that there was no major economic impact, either positive or negative, uh, and um, both for uh, the the use of heather or the fungi. And even if there was a little bit of increased cost at some points, that wouldn't be uh, preventing people from using it if the efficacy was the right one. And in terms of environmental impact, because that's something we also wanted to get a feeling about in RELAX, um, the, there was questions from people using it whether the fungi, for example, have an impact on free living nematodes or insects. Uh, but all this work has been done before and the fungi do not have an impact on any other organism except the target organism, which is the gastrointestinal nematodes. Um, the, whether the birds and other wildlife will be affected if sheep are grazing on heather was a question that was raised and this could be relevant, although as I mentioned sheep are already grazing uh, out there. Uh, so I'm not sure if it's going to make a, a really a big, a big uh, difference. Uh, the work question raised on the impact of um, uh, grazing on conservation or local biodiversity. Uh, if heather is introduced to farming area, but uh, we're mostly looking at places where heather is already available. Uh, and also some re regulatory aspects were raised. Uh, would it be legal, for example, to graze on heather if this is a conservation area? So these are all questions that uh, would need to be considered before this is uh, more widely uh, open, basically. So, um, this, these are the, the, um, uh, the, the results from uh, the farm trials and I, I thought I will summarize a little bit and give some our insight about how this could be used. So both heather and fungi have shown a lot of potential uh, but should not be seen as new drugs and, and I think we, we know that already. Uh, we need to change the way we're thinking about their use and we don't need to target 100% efficacy. Remember that first graph I showed you with, uh, uh, with uh, the, the growth of the animal, you just need to reduce the challenge and that should do the trick. Um, the immune response and the nutrition will help towards achieving control. So don't, don't think that these are new anthomintics because they're not. Um, the alternatives are to be used in a strategic manner to reduce pasture contamination uh, and they should be seen as tools in, in a toolkit to reduce anthomantic use. And we do need to know the limitations of our alternatives. There's logistical limitations, so for example, as I mentioned, the daily feeding of the spores uh, or the access to heather, you know, that may not be possible. And also, we don't know everything about the alternatives yet, so we still don't know what are the active compounds on Heather. We have made some progress on that. Uh, we, that is through RELAX as well, and I can tell you afterwards if you're interested. But also the variation in composition, we showed that different countries have different efficacies, so that's also need to be taken into account. Uh, alternatives may come at a higher cost, uh, but According to the farmers uh, opinion, both in focus groups and on trials, uh, that's not prohibitive and both farmers and advisors agreed on this. Uh, one of the key points was that we need to take the vets on board. Um, uh, it's, it was considered that a lot of um, uh, a lot of vets are not aware of the alternatives, so they don't promote them. And there may be a worry that, uh, uh, at some point, when this is more widely available, uh, some of the income may be reduced from, from drug sales. Uh, but we need to help with that to identify a novel source of income um, through the alternatives uh, and demonstrate that maintaining the efficacy of existing anthomintics is, is best for the business model anyway. Uh, and the, the, the last few things were that conventional farmers uh, are also very much interested in the alternatives. And, and uh, although this project focused on low input and organic farmers, we should not forget the conventional farmers and, and that should give the extra momentum we need. There is certainly a requirement for more on farm trials um, and we need to somehow facilitate uh, these procedures. 
Um, and condensed and enriched plants like heather uh, and like uh, some of the other bioactive plants I mentioned earlier would need to be considered within a trade-off framework. Um, and future work needs to be, uh, when I mean trade-off farm work is because it's negative or positive and we need to make sure whether the, the positive, uh, we need to make sure we use them in a way that the positives overweigh the negatives basically. Uh, and future work will need to be targeted uh, to facilitate uptake towards this uh, trade-off. We need also to improve communication between different farmers from the different countries to promote innovation. So the experience from the UK farmers could somehow be uh, shared with other countries and uh, encourage people to try things there. And we've also identified and relaxed that uh, registration is, um, for example, registration of the fungi in Europe would has taken for a very long time and it's an expensive process and it's not very easy uh, to um, to do. So that's, uh, that's a, a, something that hinders uh, uptake of the alternatives. So with that, uh, I'm going to close the presentation. I would like to thank all our relaxed collaborators uh, in the uh, in the study and work package for and all our farmers from the focus groups and the on farm trials, particularly and these uh, five other people who uh, helped us with the on farm trials. So um, that's the uh, that's it uh, from me. So I'm just going to stop sharing. And uh, I will be very happy to answer any questions you've got uh, in any aspects of this presentation. Thanks, Birudula. That was really interesting and I love how condensed it was. Um, I see a hand up from Yvonne. I was just going to say anybody who has any questions, feel free to just raise your hand. I'll call your name and you can just either unmute yourself and turn on your camera or just unmute yourself or ask questions like Leslie has been doing uh, on the chat. So we'll come to your questions, Leslie. But first, uh, Yvonne, go ahead. If you can unmute yourself. That's pretty good. Uh, sorry, am I? No, you're fine now. You're fine. We're going to hear you now, yes. Um, says I'm on me. Oh, no, I <laughs> okay. Um, really, I enjoyed doing the trial, and it's, it's, a, shame, it's a shame that we have a uh, lot of it that are more specific. But what I wondered was can the fungus live freely on the pasture? So, could we find them just that snapshot? I'm uh, sorry. Yvonne, I wasn't able to hear you because you're breaking up. So if you don't mind repeating your uh, question, please. Right, I've tried turning my camera off. Hopefully that will make it easier. Um, is there, um, again, can the fungus live freely on a more long-term result than um, the snapshot that we were looking at? Yes, so it will live much longer. It will it will live there and uh, it will keep on working. So obviously we looked at a snapshot because, you know, you have to have a specific uh, duration for something like that. But the fungus will still be there and will still be uh, working, really. Absolutely. Yes. So if this makes sense, Virgil, I'm going to go through some of the questions that Leslie was asking on the chat. And first yeah. question was whether the lotus is bird's food trefoil. Oh, that yes, yep. That solves it. And then there was a question about what food intake was used to carry the spores and whether this could have an influence on the result. For example, if fungi on cereals can interact with Dedunctonia, how does it work? No, we, we, we do not expect. I mean, they have done a lot of studies in the countries where this has been uh, licensed in order to prove that this is not interfering with any any other um, microorganism or insect or pathogen even, or, you know, that's not the target one. So we're confident to say that it's only the gastrointestinal nematodes that are affected um, by by this fungus. So it, it shouldn't be interfering with anything else. That sounds great. I don't think we have questions from the audience, but I did get a couple of um, questions by mail. So let me open that. Yeah. Uh, there was one about in general, what sort of like what other um, practices could be combined with these specific ones 
to make it more effective because as you mentioned they're not going to be 100 percent effective and you probably need like a set right. of so this is really a very good question and uh to that effect uh anna we're writing that uh, practice abstract uh about the basket of options and i think maybe this audience would be interested in getting a copy uh when we have that ready so in addition to, to those alternatives, it's the, the targeted treatment and targeted selective treatment, which is uh, dosing with the alpha take only certain groups of animals, either um, depending on the age or their uh, periperturian state or something like that, or animals that are uh, appear not to not to be growing the way they should be they should be growing. So this is again limiting the use of alpha mintics to certain groups of animals, which is I'm not quite sure um, how this would be applied in organic farms, Anna. I don't know if you are aware of uh, that or no. I'm sure there are ways of uh, applying that in organic farms, as well, but this is one of the one of the solutions. Another one would be to uh, supplement with nutrients uh, at times of uh, nutrient scarcity. Uh, for example, you will be aware of the periperturian rise in the worm accounts in use. Um, so when the animals are pregnant and they're lactating, uh, usually because of um, uh, low intake uh, to that required of certain nutrients and protein in particular, there is an increase in the fecal accounts in animals that are other, otherwise be immune. So by um, supplementing animals at times of uh, nutrients... Sure. Pardon? Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. If so, it's on my side, by my side. Okay. So by supp supplementing animals at times of protein of protein or other nutrient scarcity uh, is also an important one. Uh, so, uh, and we are in Relax are putting together all these uh, strategies in a, in a practice abstract and we're currently writing this. So once this is... Uh, uh, ready, then uh, I'm sure uh, we can circulate it and then you can uh, have it and uh, further, you know, disseminate it. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to share it. And uh, I was also just putting there, there's the Relax website where you can go and if you put Anthomintics in the, in the search, uh, you can find all the information that we've been creating, but also you can just sort of like see what else is there that might be interesting yep. for you. Um, I think there's another question that, again, sent from uh, from far in terms of how are there any specific dosages that people should be considering when when sort of like trying to um, provide heather for the animals or is it just as and when they want to have them? Yeah, so, well, to be honest, we really don't know that yet. We, what I can tell you is we did a control study uh, where we were chopping heather and we were supplementing our animals with, uh, and we know that they were eating about 250 grams of dry matter heather uh, a day as part of their diet. Uh, and this did show a significant antiparasitic effect, so their fecal accounts uh, were significantly reduced and the fecundity of the worms were significantly reduced. And the number of worms was reduced, although it wasn't a significant effect, but there was also a reduction there. Uh, now, when you have animals grazing outside, of course, you don't have any control on how much they will eat. Um, uh, so this is, I think, the next step to see whether animals would eat enough, basically, on grazing conditions. But at the moment, we don't mm, we don't have a feeling about that. That's great. Um, then I think there was a question around. Sorry, kind of lost it. Oh, here it is. It's um, a question around sort of um, how do you compare the different efficacy of Heather in different environments? So is it different in different countries? How does it work in general? I think that you've answered that question, but it might be worth repeating. Yeah, so so we, we have definitely seen that uh, different countries, uh, Heather from different countries has different efficacy. Now, we uh, we have started looking into why this may be the case. And as a first step, what we've done in this project is we have uh, analyzed the different heather extracts for uh, their polyphenol content. So condensed tannins, which I mentioned before, is, is uh, polyphenols. 
uh, but there are other polyphenols as well. So we, we try to associate uh, polyphenol, um, differential polyphenol content with the biological activity. Uh, and we're currently uh, working with that. Uh, and we have seen so far, I can tell you, is that it's not just condensed studies that uh, may have the anti antiparasitic activity. It could very well be other compounds uh, that are active as well. Yes, just to make things a bit more interesting, you know, add more in the mix. You're not going to get out of my work soon. It seems like you've been working for a few years. That's the questions that we had. I'm not sure if anybody has any more comments or questions, whether either about this particular work or in general about anthelmintics. I mean, I would just say that's very a source of knowledge for these things. Um, uh, so if you have any questions, just raise your hand. But also, uh, we will be sharing all this information with everyone. So we'll give it a second just in case anybody does. Yes. Questions for a trialist? I hate to put them on the spot, but they're there. Catherine, talking about trialists, is there. Kath, go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, mine was more of a comment, I suppose, really, about I did. Sure. So I was one of the Heather trialists, and I definitely noticed so my sheep were in an area where they did have quite a lot of grass as well as heather and they were mainly eating the grass but it as yeah it was lambing time so they were probably trying to get the protein and they but it did seem to be sort of certain sheep at certain times would go into the bog and sort of nibble on the heather um but also to say that in my in the bog and the heath there's a real mix of the different heathers so it's not just ling it's also bell and the cross heath heather too um so i don't know what sort of effect that has on on intake and effect but um yeah and also just about the ticks i my pasture has ticks in it anyway so i um yeah my sheep get ticks all the time <laughs> but it's never terrible <laughs> just sort of constant low level yeah 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 no that's great Catherine thanks for for sharing your experience it's um um to, to answer the question about uh, I mean this to me this is the most interesting thing to see if you have if you have animals on you know grazing on a on a mixture of things how much time do you spend on each? And there are ways of actually doing that. Uh, to, I mean, experimentally measuring that, how much of heaven they're eating, how much grass they're eating, how much of anything else they're eating. Uh, but it's um, it's tricky. But it, it may be something that we want to do in, in the future just to get a better feel on how much these animals are eating and is what they're eating in the wild enough uh, to help them with their uh, parasite problems, basically. Yeah. Gwen has a question, so Gwen, go. Uh, so just to say that my sheep didn't really have access to nice grass, so they were a bit more forced to eat the heather. And my mine were the sheep that lost weight in comparison to their the guys on the better ground. So um, uh, yes. they had a, a few ticks, but that's what you sort of expect on on heather. So that's just that wasn't a big. A big issue um, and I think what I noticed was because we've got an age of sheep um, some of the sheep came from Macherland and they're not used to eating heather so I'm sort of thinking for myself I might um, put my lambs when they're still young enough to be sort of trying all the different products onto the heather so they nibble away at it have a go at it and then when you know if I can work out the best times of year to, to put them there um, they might get they might eat it a bit more, whereas the older sheep were perhaps not so keen to even try it. But yeah, the, the quality of the grass on the heather for them was pretty, pretty poor. So yeah. I think that's why they lost weight. But um, yeah, they had twins as well. So you expect them to be losing weight at that time yeah. of year. So it was a bit, um, yeah, I can see how your results aren't, you know, as, you know, very it's, clear it's complex it's clear i mean there's many reasons why they're not clear uh, this is some of the ones you uh, you mentioned but also it is small scale and when you have animals that are so variable anyway you know it's very difficult to in small scale trials to um to get clear clear results 
in our control study, uh, I will say it again, where animals were individually penned, so we were able to, to see how much they were eating, so how much they were growing and everything, it was clear that heather intake of about 250 grams a day reduced parasite burden, but it also reduced um, uh, what, not intake, but the weight of the animals. It was a temporary reduction, uh, so the animals caught up, really, uh, but for a short time there was a reduction in the uh, in the weight, and that was because initially they were not eating the heather. So, like your sheep, Gwen, they weren't used to uh, seeing heather before, so they saw heather, it was a big drop in intake, and wow, what's that? But then once they go used to it, they, they did reach of a very decent uh, intake of heather, uh, and I mean, um, in some cases, they were, some of them were eating more more heather than hay, and some of them were, uh, the control ones were trying to nibble on the heather from their neighboring uh, pens. So it was, it's, uh, not knowing the forage is very true, what you said, uh, so trying to introduce them from a young age would be ideal, um, and, and that would give them the experience and everything, but uh, I, I, it, it's an issue. So, so it could be that the reduction in the weight is associated with that rather than anything else that's in Heather. Go ahead, Wen. And just to say that um, I, if you're interested, I can see which of the lambs, because I, I, they're all marked individually, you can see that some of them are growing better than others, but I don't have it in my head right now whether it's the Heather, uh, you know, early start Heather ones are doing better, worse, the same, random, it's probably more to do with their mother, but um, it might be interesting to see, you know, just to add add to the mix. So. Yes, so if you had time to do that, I would be interested to look at this data, yes. Okay, and um, because we've got Hebrideans, we um, don't slaughter them till they're sort of 18 months anyway, so any sort of weight loss is not That's as right. critical, I don't think. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. and as long as they're not sort of permanently stunted, <laughs> then, uh, you know, I think they can recover with a good, good growing season. Yes, so. yeah, yeah. We have. Can I in, oh, go ahead. Can I throw in a completely random one? You so feel free to answer it at some other time. But a lot of our lambs really love the lichen growing on the rocks. They love it. They absolutely love it. And uh, so much so that they're eating it all. I wish they wouldn't eat it all. And now they've um, started eating the seaweed from the shore, whereas, again, their mothers never do that. So they, I think they're just like babies almost. They stick things in their mouth to see how what it tastes of. So, um, But I don't know why they, if, if you have any ideas why, what it is in lichen, and I don't have the species name, I'm afraid, but they, they just yeah. love it. Um, and I just wonder if what's going on there. So, as I say, probably a question for another day, but there you go. <laughs> well, the, short, the short answer is I don't, I don't know. I don't even know what that is from, from the rock you're saying. Like, likening, what's that? Likens. Likenes? No? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, thank you. That, that's how I would say it in Greek as well. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> No, uh, no, I don't know why they would eat it. Uh, seaweed, I can tell you seaweed, um, I, I, I don't know why they would eat seaweed either. Maybe some of, uh, if we have any vets that uh, are listening to, maybe they can point us towards any deficiencies or maybe, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. We can look it up and I can ask around and I'll let you know when. And I'll try and tell you what species of lichen it is. Okay. Yeah. Be good. And pictures. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah, just to say, mine absolutely love lichen too. It's mainly off the trees that they get it, but um, and the fence posts. But yeah, they are all about the lichen. Mm. Okay, thank you. I'll have to look into that. I really don't know. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's four years coming. Yeah, that's sort of. <laughs> There's questions on the chat, Anna. Yes. There's a question from Felipe asking how, uh, if you've had any experience mixing feed with rock dust extract. No, I don't even know what rock dust extract is. Uh, I don't know if Felipe wants to unmute and tell us. I really don't know what that is. If Felipe's around, feel free to 
yeah. either comment on the chat or unmute whatever is easier. In the meantime, we can answer to Nori, who's asking when was the trial carried out as sheep will select for heather in winter when no grass growth, but not generally the rest of the year. So yes, very good point. The trial was spring, was it spring and summer. Uh, so that's a very good point. But as, as I did mention from our experience on the um, control study, they wouldn't eat it initially, but they would very, very much eat it once they go familiarized with it. Uh, and we did nutritional analysis on the um, heather and the hay that we were offering, and we we're very similar nutritionally. So it's not that heather is really rubbish uh, forage. It's not actually. Um, it's it was it, it had a very similar composition to the hay that we offered. So um, yeah, obviously grass is going to be more lush and more desirable, but um, they will learn to eat it. That, that would be my um, experience. Based on that, I was wondering, do you know if there is a particular time of the year when they would prefer to go for Heather, like if it's young shoots or it's like? Yeah, they will definitely not only be eating the young shoots. They will not be eating the, the green stuff. But in our trial, we uh, analyzed for uh, the secondary, the active metabolites, both what of the of the heather we offered and also of the heather that was re refused and we found that most heather was actually in the part they were eating not so much in the part that was refused so that's also good news because that means that they are able to eat uh, the heather that has the active compound in so that that gives potential <clears throat> to be used to, for it to be used more that's what i mean that sounds good Last shout out for people's questions. Oh, okay. Felipe is saying that in Brazil, they do an experiment to evaluate rock dust with intestinal mineralization. Look at that. Great. <laughs> great, great. Yeah, no, I don't know anything about that. Felipe, you have to send the information. Yes. Send it in, send it in Brazilian. It'll be a challenge for all of us to translate. So that'll be fun. Yep. Um, last call for questions. Do remember, though, that if you don't have a question now, but then five minutes later you have a pressing question, you can always contact us and ask for them because um, this is sort of like an ongoing life. Life, would you say it's sort of like a life challenge at this point, Spiritula? <laughs> Feels like, yeah. like it's still going to be going. And um, we have our amazing trialists as well that we can always reach out and ask for questions. So yeah. if you have questions down the line, if you can throw them my way, I'll make sure to start sending them around just to make sure that the right person gets them. Um, and so if you don't have any further questions, I'm going to say thank you so much, Spiridula. Oh, no, here, Carolyn asking if you re would recommend overseeing with some point and chicory. So I'm assuming just um, yeah, I would certainly recommend any, to be honest, any combination. Overseeing, sorry, overseeing. That's, I was like uh, overseeing, just keeping an eye on the animals. I'm not sure. <laughs> overseeing. Uh, overseeding. Oh, we'll see. <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, well, I really don't know. Uh, personally, I really don't know um, how that would work. And where are you based? So in Scotland, we tried to establish same point and it was not having it. You know, it was too cold, too um, uh, South Devon. You may have some luck. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. In, in Scotland, same point wasn't a hit. Chicory does better. It, do, it does good in different different conditions. It's not. It's not. If it's too wet, maybe not so much. But chicory is quite. It's more robust than same point. So um, I mean, I I don't have personal experience of that. Um, so I shouldn't probably advise, but uh, all I can say is based on our experience, Symphon didn't do well here. South Devon will definitely do better. Um, and maybe there is some uh, scope of uh, overseeding, but uh, I, I'm not sure. Sorry, I'm not very helpful here. Uh, no, I just put a, a link there to a resource page that we had on something that I just found out. But Carolyn, I'm not an expert, so I'm happy to ask Kate, who's our expert in all things livestock and the South 
So I'll ask her and Fat Farmers is a project that we're running in the South and that should have a fair amount of information. And I know that Herbalisa has been a big topic. So I'll make sure to keep an eye on it. And Nari is saying that she has no direct experience, but conversations suggest that chicory is best established as a new lay and hard to seed and established password. Sure. Um, yes, so yeah. in our experience, uh, we all we always uh, when we work with chicory, we always had new lay. Uh, so but, and we never tried to have two together. However, chicory is quite robust, so it will keep coming up and, and again and again. So it doesn't have to be new every year. Um, I, I think it's a, in general there are, you know, there are, I don't remember the names now, but there are companies that are selling mixture of this. Now the question is whether it's going to be enough of it in uh, in a mixture, basically, to provide any uh, unfermented benefit. Uh, and I'm not sure to answer this question, but nutritionally, I think, uh, it will, it will it, the, you know, the, the, there are certain seeds, seed mixes that people that are selling that have potentially nutritionally are, are good, but I just don't know if it's the, it's good for parasites. I don't have experience. Spiridula, we have one minute to go. So I think okay. it's time to say thank you to everyone. Uh, and thanks for your questions. It's always so interesting because it sort of like opens new avenues to think about lichens, for example, which yes. I have in my radar. I'm not sure if you had them. Yes, yes, yeah. No, so no. thank you everyone for participating today. It's really interesting. As I mentioned, the um, the recording will be uploaded. You can also find a lot of information about Relax. We'll share the, the link in the follow up email. And as Spiridula says, if you're interested, we can more than happily share um, the, the final document that we're preparing a little yes. bit later in the year. Yeah, yeah. And thank you, Spirit Doula, and our trialists. You have no idea. I mean, not not to brag, but it's been great fun just working on this project. So I would just I know that I'm not the trialist, but I'm not sure if the trialist would agree. But it's it's really interesting doing this sort of like bridge between practical and uh, research and sort of like I would just invite anyone that given the opportunity to join because I think it's really, really enriching. No, absolutely, and uh, I think it was um, it was a, a, a pleasure and a privilege really being able to do it through this uh, project. So thank you on my part as well. Thank you, Anne, and thank you all for uh, attending, uh, and uh, to the trialists for making this possible. Yes, for sure. Great. So thank you, everyone, and again, just let us know if you have any questions. But for the meantime, bye. bye. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Bye bye.